In 1944, the Gloucester Company rolled out the Meteor, the RAF's first production line jet fighter. Frank Whittle's vision was finally vindicated. When the Meteor became operational, all he could say really was there, well, ab about time too. Eric Brown was one of the first pilots to fly in the Whittle-powered jet. Moving from piston engine to a jet engine to aircraft was a revelation. I think the first thing that struck one was the fantastic view. No propeller ahead of you and no large long-nosed piston engine. As the war drew to a close, the Meteor defended the shores of England, deemed too big a secret to fly into enemy skies. It would never meet its nemesis, the ME-262. Victory in Europe finally came on May the 8th, 1945. Two days after the capitulation, Captain Eric Brown was ordered into the rubble of Germany to uncover her jet secrets hidden amongst the spoils of war. When I first saw an ME-262, it looked a very lethal aeroplane. It reminded one vividly of a shark, and uh, the whole thing was just an aspect of lethality. And by far, in my opinion, the most formidable aircraft of World War II. Here in Seattle, they're uncovering the secrets of Hitler's most feared jet warplane, the ME-262. German and British jet innovation took alternative routes to achieve the same end. There was a striking difference in engines uh, that the 262 used, the Yuma 004 and the British Meteor. Both these new jet engines produced similar thrust, but there was a fundamental difference in the way they breathed. The Whittle engine used one large compressor disc at the front of the engine. This forced air outwards centrifugally into combustion chambers that encircled this central disc. They called it a centrifugal engine. The air is drawn in here. It is compressed by the the single disc with the blades on. When that air is compressed, it comes out of there and round, is curved round through these veins and takes the air pressure straight into the flame tube. Once that air pressure is sufficient, we introduce fuel. So now we have a mixture of air pressure and fuel. Everything okay? The pilot then presses the switch and it lights it. All these are interconnected, and they go woof. The German axial flow engine was altogether different. Instead of one large disc, it used a series of small ones, each compressing the air tighter and tighter into one central combustion chamber. The Germans went very quickly with uh, axial flow compressors, which means the air is being accelerated along the axis of the engine. And the difference between the engines would prove significant. To make the engines more and more powerful, they would need to provide more and more air to the oxygen-hungry burners. The only way the centrifugal engine could satisfy those demands was by making the single compressor disc larger, which makes the engine fatter not aerodynamically friendly. In order for the ME262 axial flow engine to suck in more air, all engineers had to do was to add more and more compressor discs. This meant a longer, more slender engine, far better suited for sleek airplanes. But in 1944, it had one big disadvantage. Materials available in those days just did not withstand the stresses and the temperatures that these engines developed. Jet engines are subject to incredibly high temperatures. In the ME-262, the finely engineered blades 
were particularly vulnerable. Its engines only lasted an average of 25 hours, even less if the fuel flow wasn't regulated properly by sensitive use of the throttle. Eric Brown was one of Britain's top test pilots. He was selected to fly captured German warplanes and report back what he found. The first German jet I flew was the Parado 234s, the reconnaissance bomber twin jet. Same engines as the ME262. I taxied it out to the end of the runway, ran up the engines to full power and was just about to release the brakes for takeoff when the starboard engine exploded, blew clean out of the airframe, taking most of the starboard wing with it. In 1944, the metal alloys required to build a successful axial flow jet engine simply didn't exist. The materials of the day were not as advanced as the jet engine that needed them. Whittle was well aware of axial flow principles, but in 1930, he decided that it was too complex for the time. The fact that today this 60-year-old Meteor is still flying on its original engines stands testament to Whittle's engineering prowess. After the Second World War, the arrival of the jet had already started to change the warplane. But there is more to a successful warplane than the engine alone. And back in 1946, there was still a long way to go. On September the 27th, 1946, a dashing 36-year-old test pilot called Geoffrey de Havilland set out to make history. He was preparing to beat the world record of 616 miles per hour and become the fastest man on the planet. To do so, he would be flying close to the speed of sound. At sea level, this is 760 miles per hour. His aircraft, a prototype built by his father's company, the DH-108 Swallow. Jeffrey de Havilland took to the air, but at Mach 0.9, a whisker from history, the plane disintegrated over the Thames estuary. The death of such a competent pilot shocked everyone. In a desperate search to uncover the cause for the crash, engineers strengthened a second swallow to follow de Havilland's flight plan. All they needed now was a pilot. There was only one man for the job, and it wasn't long before his world, too, began to shake apart. You had an aeroplane going along and literally doing this. Almost a blur, it was oscillating so violently. With the G, I couldn't get my arms up to reach the, the blind and pull the, the blind to eject. The instincts that kept Eric Brown alive in Germany kicked in again. After seven seconds of this, it stopped as, quick as, as, as quickly as it had begun. Eric Brown had hit an invisible barrier and survived, and his was not an isolated experience. All the leading nations of the world had very serious problems with high-performance fighter airplanes going out of control or beginning to go out of control as they flew faster and faster. Little was known of the practical effects of high-speed flight. New wind tunnels were constructed to simulate wind speeds close to the speed of sound, speeds known as transonic. Using Schlieren photography in the new tunnels revealed high pressure areas forming all over the aircraft. This was the so-called compressibility crisis or the beginnings of 